Hello and welcome to the webinar on anaerobic soil disinfestation to control soil-borne pathogens, current research findings by Carol Shannon and Joji Morimoto of the University of California, Santa Cruz. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. We're very pleased to welcome back Carol Shannon and Joji Morimoto to update us on their work on this project. We had a previous webinar about ASD in 2011, which is available in our archive. Dr. Carol Shannon is a professor in the Environmental Studies Department at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She's been working on issues of agricultural sustainability for many years in the US and abroad, focusing most recently on crop rotation, soil fertility, and disease management in organic strawberry and vegetable production systems in coastal California. Dr. Joji Morimoto is an associate researcher at the Department of Environmental Studies, also at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He's a soil scientist and agroecologist specializing in fertility and soil-borne disease management in organic strawberries and vegetables in coastal California. Another co-author of the webinar whom I'd like to acknowledge is Mark Mazzola of the USDA ARS in Wenatchee, Washington. Okay, well thank you everybody. Um, as Alice said, I'm going to be talking about our latest work on anaerobic soil disinfestation. Uh, and talk some about our experiences with um, growers who are implementing it uh, on the farm. Before we start, I should go over what we mean by anaerobic soil disinfestation. Um, basically, it's a process where you add organic material providing a food source for soil microbes and then make the soil go anaerobic, that is, uh, remove oxygen from the soil and maintain it in a no oxygen environment for a period of time. And during this time, that stimulates um, anaerobic bacteria um, to decompose the organic material you've added. And it's thought that the byproducts of this decomposition are toxic to a variety of pathogens. So basically what you do is you incorporate some kind of organic material. It can be grass residue, rice bran, even ethanol. Um, cover the soil with an in oxygen impermeable tarp and then irrigate to saturate the soil and then maintain the soil at around field capacity uh, for a period of time, usually a few weeks, in our case three weeks. Now ASD is being done in slightly different forms uh, in different parts of the world, primarily in Japan and the Netherlands and here in the US. And this table uh, shows sort of currently the, how it's being done in different parts of the world. And in the US, we've got work going on here in California, uh, but also in Florida and Tennessee, and then in, in Japan and the Netherlands. And if you just take a look at the, um, the table, you can see that a number of different carbon sources are being used in this work, depending on uh, the place and the cropping system in, in question. And th uh, that a number of different pathogens have been shown to be controlled by this technique. Um, I should point out that the crops that this is typically used with um, are all high value crops. Uh, it's a somewhat expensive technique, so um, it's only really appropriate for, for high value specialty uh, crops. So I want to show you a little bit of what um, it ASD looks like. Um, this is a field and a greenhouse being prepared with ASD in Japan um, where they do the, do the method as a flat um, application and you can see the drip tape lying underneath the tarp and so that will, uh, once the tarp is down then the irrigation will be done to bring the soil uh, to saturation. Now in Japan, uh, they've started using ethanol um, as the carbon source in many systems. And I just put this list up here uh, for the range of pests, including some nematodes that are controlled by ethanol-based ASD. And again, the crops that it's been tested on.
Now in the Netherlands, um, the system is a little different. It's cooler um, and the tarping period is usually four to six weeks long. Um, and they typically use grass residues uh, as the carbon source. But again, um, this technique has been shown to work for a range of uh, fungal pathogens, bacteria, and nematodes, and for some weeds. But I'm going to focus primarily on the California system, uh, where we're using this technique uh, for producing strawberries. And this table um, shows the uh, extent to which the, the technique's been used over the last two years. You can see in 2012, we had uh, a total of 130 acres uh, were put into ASD, uh, mostly organic ground. And uh, this was, work was done by 18 different growers, uh, but across 24 sites, uh, primarily as strawberries. Um, and a few raspberries. In 2013, that acreage increased up to 430 acres, uh, this time with 29 growers. And most of the growers who did it in 2012 also um, have done ASD in the fall of 2013. And uh, this average site size um, is, is close to nine acres now. And I think the largest we have is 20 acres. And this time it's most, still mostly organic fields, um, but there are some conventional fields uh, where it's being tested as well. And again, primarily with strawberries, but also raspberries and uh, the other is some herbs. So this shows a picture of one of our ASD trial sites uh, down in Ventura in California, Southern California. And you can see the picture in the fall when ASD is being applied, when you can see the field tarped and uh, the grower wanted to try using um, the black tarp or the clear tarp uh, for comparison. And then the other three pictures show you uh, what the fields looked like last week. Um, either the untreated control, uh, ASD, where the carbon source was three tons per acre of rice bran and two tons per acre of mustard seed meal, or in the top right, um, our most common um, treatment we use, which is ASD with rice bran applied at nine tons per acre. And you can see the dramatic difference between uh, the ASD with the, the rice bran especially um, versus the untreated control at this point. And this is partly, uh, we think, a fertility response as well as a disease um, control response, but we'll talk more about that later. So basically, if you're going to do ASD, there are five steps. Um, you have to plan when and where you're going to do it. And then we'll talk about each step in turn, the rice bran application and incorporation, adding the drip tapes and plastic mulch, doing the irrigation, and then importantly, monitoring how well uh, the anaerobic conditions are created. So when? Ideally, you would like to do it at the warmest time of the year. Uh, it's pretty clear that the higher the temperature, the stronger the disease control. Um, that may not always be possible because of other economic considerations, but as we'll see, we need to have um, some, you know, we can't do it when the soil's too cold. It just doesn't work. So for controlling verticillium dalii, for example, um, we recommend that the soil temperature should be above 68 degrees Fahrenheit at six inches depth uh, for at least the first week of the ASD treatment. However, for Vusarium oxysporum, um, data from our Japanese uh, colleagues suggest that the soil temperature needs to be much higher to get good control. Here above 86 degrees Fahrenheit for three weeks. So uh, deciding when you can fit it in um, to your operation is, is a critical um, step. Okay, so I'll just describe the technique using the rice bran, since that's what's most commonly used at this point. 
and we recommend applying it at six to nine tons per acre and most growers broadcast it with a manure spreader and then incorporate it with a rototiller or some other um, equipment to get incorporation ideally down uh, six to twelve inches and this shows um, the operation uh, a couple of examples of different manure spreaders being used to spread um, the rice bran and then it being incorporated um, after it's been spread across the field then we come through and shape the beds and in doing that um, the rice bran gets evenly distributed throughout the bed um, because you're taking soil and putting it on that's got the rice bran incorporated in it and put it on top of other soil that already has rice bran Now some growers made a modification to this um, where they decided they just wanted to apply the rice bran to the tops of the beds, not to the whole field. Uh, the idea being then you could concentrate the rice bran just in the bed area um, and they, to do this they had to develop, um, they created their own equipment for just uh, depositing the rice bran on the top of the, the bed and then followed it with um, some kind of rototiller to incorporate it um, while still maintaining the bed structure. So and there are a couple of examples of the equipment that, that uh, farmers use. So once you've um, got the beds perfectly shaped then apply the drip tape and plastic mulch. And once the plastic mulch is in place and well um, sealed along the edges, then um, you could start the irrigation. The, for the first irrigation, the aim is to try and saturate the bed or as close to saturated as possible, um, obviously before the bed starts to collapse, which uh, you have to really be careful with sandy soils um, to watch for that. And typically we found that takes one to two acre inches uh, of irrigation depending on what your soil type is. And an important point is that you ideally want to start the process um, with the irrigation within 48 hours uh, or so um, from the time that you incorporated the rice bran. Otherwise if you leave the rice bran sitting in the field for too long in the soil it'll be decomposed aerobically and there won't be enough carbon to drive the process once you make it anaerobic. So the sooner um, the irrigation can be applied after the rice bran was incorporated, the better. And most farmers have found that um, you can do about a maximum of five acre blocks at a time. And so this shows um, checking on how well the, the irrigation is going in terms of saturating the beds. Uh, the upper picture is clearly not um, sufficiently wet yet and the lower picture you can see the water starting to puddle uh, at the base of the bed and that's um, time to stop watering. Okay, so after the first irrigation then the goal is to keep the field um, at around or above field capacity for the remainder of the three weeks by intermittently adding more water as needed. And we found that in general this takes about a total of three acre inches um, for the three week period. That includes what's supplied in the first irrigation. And then um, we want to monitor how well the system becomes anaerobic and there are a couple of ways to do this. Uh, the most precise way is to use what's known as an ORP sensor. That stands for oxidation reduction potential sensor and that measures how anaerobic the soil becomes. And the lower the number um, that is uh, read with the sensor, the stronger the anaerobic conditions. Now the sensors cost about 80 to 100 dollars each 
and you need a handheld meter uh, to take the reading, and they cost between two and four hundred dollars. And it says then that we want to get above fifty thousand cumulative EH millivolt hours um, of anaerobicity. And don't worry about that, I will explain what that means in just a moment. Uh, but we found that's a key um, as a threshold for controlling verticillium. If you don't want to go to the expense of um, buying an ORP sensor and monitoring how anaerobic the this, this field becomes, one good test is to go and smell the soil. Um, if it's really anaerobic, within a week you will get a rather unpleasant smell um, of, of anaerobic decomposition. And you can take a, a core of soil um, out of one of your beds and smell it, and uh, it's really apparent if it's anaerobic or not. But one thing to watch out for is, for some reason, we found that clay soils don't really smell very much, even when they've gone anaerobic. A couple of other tips. Uh, for high disease pressure fields, um, start the ASD as early as possible with as warm of soil as possible and keep it anaerobic, uh, maybe for longer than three weeks if that's possible too. Um, we also recommend that you don't just rely on ASD for disease suppression, but use it along with the sound crop rotation. And ASD is indeed a work in progress. Um, and has, we don't know everything we need to know about, about it yet. Um, so there's still more we're learning as we go along. Some things we have found out. Uh, from early on, we discovered, at least with suppressing verticillium, and the same's been true in uh, the Netherlands and Japan, that you can use um, a number of different carbon sources and still get disease suppression. And this is just an example from some of our early pot studies where we've tried carbon sources like wheat bran, rice bran, ethanol, grape pumice, onion waste, and mustard cake. And the bars show how much um, the number of viable verticillium dalii, uh, microsclerotia, the little um, resting spores, how many are viable in the soil. And you can see in the control treatment, it's about uh, 42 per gram of soil. After ASD with the different carbon sources, those numbers are reduced by 90% to 100% depending on um, the different carbon sources. So that means that we should have some flexibility in terms of what carbon source we can use. Now this is what, uh, I have when I want to explain what we mean by uh, changes in soil EH or redox potential. And that's the measure of how anaerobic the soil is. And so the, t the top line, the pink, is for a control treatment that doesn't have a tarp and wasn't irrigated. Um, and so that's what an aerobic soil, a soil with lots of oxygen, would look like. The EH would be around, was around 300 millivolts. The brown line shows how the EH changes during the ASD process. And you can see that it goes down, becomes very negative, and then comes back up um, once the carbon source has been used up. And so in terms of measuring that, we want to know, um, you know how anaerobic does the soil have to become and for how long to get good disease suppression. So to look at that, um, we know that once the, the EH gets below 200 millivolts, then that's considered to be anaerobic. So that's the dotted line that I've put on the graph. And then we, at any time, we can measure how much below that 200 millivolt um, the reading is. And essentially, um, what we, we do is work out how much below 200 millivolts and for how long um, the, the anaerobic conditions were maintained. And we calculated basically that blue area under the curve. And 
we multiply the um, number of millivolts below 200 millivolts by time for each of the time intervals and add them together. And if we do that, we can get a cumulative value for how many hours of EH below 200 millivolts and how much below 200 millivolts um, is accumulated. And in this particular case, that would be 112,536 millivolt hours. Whereas, of course, the aerobic treatment, it's zero because it never got below 200. So we did this so that we could see if there was a relationship between how anaerobic the soil became and how effectively it controlled the disease. And it was very clear. Um, if you look at this graph, and I just want you to look at the dark blue dots for now, you can see that along the bottom are the measures of cumulative EH in millivolt hours below 200 millivolts. And you can see that once you get past around 50,000, then the number of viable microscorotia is consistently low. Less than 50,000, then it's really variable. Some are low, but some are high. So what that tells us is that we need to accumulate, as a guideline, at least 50,000 millivolt hours below 200 millivolts to get good suppression of verticillium dallii. Um, and that's the, the, an important threshold that we look for in the field. The other thing is if we look at the yellow triangles, we don't see that relationship at all. No matter how high the cumulative EH um, was, we didn't see any noticeable suppression of the verticillium. And that's because those pots were kept at 15 degrees centigrade, which uh, as opposed to the others being at 25 degrees centigrade. So 15 degrees centigrade is too cold for the technique to work. So even though it becomes anaerobic, it's not suppressing the disease because it's too cold. And we'll talk a little bit more about why we might see this difference um, with some of our later data. Okay, so, whoops, um, I just jumped. I don't know why, it just jumped halfway down the, there we go. Okay, so we did a number of field trials and we talked about this a couple of years ago. And I just want to summarize the main things we found from our, our first trials. And we found that pretty consistently we got very good yields when we used nine tons per acre of rice bran as the carbon source for the ASD. And that typically we got yields equivalent to, or in some cases better than the fumigants, either methyl bromide or picklor. In one trial, uh, we got within 15% of methyl bromide yields, and that was in an extremely high yielding field. Um, but in general, we got as good or better um, yields, and we typically got 80 to 100% decrease in the number of verticillium microsclerotia in the soil. Um, so, and that's important to remember, it's not always 100%, um, but 80, 90 to 100% uh, was typically what we saw. Now, standard TARP we found was as effective as the more expensive, totally impermeable films or very impermeable films. And while we saw some reduction in certain weeds, overall weed suppression uh, in the conditions we have here on the coast of California um, was not, um, ASD wasn't really effective at suppressing a lot of weeds. It may be more effective where you have higher soil temperatures and you can get some benefits of solarization at the same time. Okay, so more recent results. Um, this is showing data from a farm in Santa Maria and it's a very um, high yielding field 
and even so, uh, and there's no obvious disease in this field. Um, but we can see that um, the yields were highest in the ASD treatment, which had nine tons per acre of rice bran, and the Piclor 60 fumigant treatment. Now, the other treatments were either use of fish emulsion um, as a, an amendment that was applied through the drip tape, or a combination of ASD and fish, fish emulsion um, applied through the drip tape, or ASD with rice bran and mustard seed meal. And you can see there was no benefit of adding the fish emulsion or the mustard seed meal to the rice bran. Okay, so what are the economics? Um, we worked out the partial costs and returns for this particular site. And what this graph shows you uh, in the light orange bars is the revenue after you've subtracted the harvest cost. Uh, since harvest costs for strawberries are an enormous part of the budget and are obviously related to how, um, how the yield of the strawberries is. The light green bars are the cost of the treatment. And then the dark orange bars are the net revenue after you've subtracted both the harvest and the treatment costs. So that's sort of the bottom line um, to look at. And you can see for the ASD, the treatment cost uh, at the time was about $2,200 an acre. That's using nine tons per acre of rice bran. And that compared with about $12,000 for Piclor, the fumigant that was used. Uh, for comparison, methyl bromide costs about $3,500 an acre at this point. And so if we look at the net revenue above harvest and treatment costs, you can see that um, the ASD at 27,600 was with uh, was about a thousand dollars lower than uh, the fumigant treatment, basically reflecting the difference in the treatment cost. The yields were essentially identical, and this is one of the few non-fumigant alternatives that is ever that comes close to the same sort of economic returns as you get with the fumigant. This is from a different site. Um, this is in Watsonville. And I'm showing this to show two different responses that we saw. Um, in 2011, you can see that uh, the untreated control and a treatment that just had mustard seed meal incorporated into the soil both yielded much lower than the rest of the treatments, which were either ASD with rice bran ASD with rice bran and mustard meal, steam, or steam plus mustard seed meal, or the fumigant Piclor 60. In 2011, the ASD did just as well as the fumigant and steam. However, in 2012, we saw a different response. Interestingly, the mustard seed meal um, showed some benefit that year. And that was actually a different source of mustard seed meal that we used from the previous year that was obviously somewhat effective. Um, but the ASD with just rice bran um, was much lower than the fumigant this time. And you can ask why was the different response uh, between the two years. The reason for that was in 2012, um, we tried to reduce the amount of water that we added uh, during the ASD process. Instead of adding about three acre inches, we only added 1.8 acre inches. As a result, this graph shows you the cumulative each EH uh, millivolt hours that we accumulated, and you can see we did not reach the 50,000 threshold. Um, and as a result, we didn't get um, good disease suppression. Whereas in both Watsonville the previous year and in Santa Maria, the data I showed you first, we exceeded that 50,000 threshold. So clearly, it's important to add sufficient water to get 
uh, strong anaerobic conditions. Now this shows some of the data from this trial in Watsonville where we uh, there wasn't uh, native verticillium in the soil so we buried uh, little packets of inoculated soil to see how um, the verticillium was affected by the treatments and you can see that uh, in terms of verticillium the mustard seed meal on its own didn't have any um, suppressive effect but the ASD um, greatly reduced the number of microsclerotia um, and this is the ASD with rice bran and there's no significant difference between any of these treatments in terms of the survival of microsclerotia. So um, this was referring to the 2011 when we did get uh, good conditions. We also looked at the effects of these treatments on some other fungi as well as verticillium and this was work that Mark Mazzola did where he looked at which fungi he could isolate from roots of the strawberry plant. And the top graph shows the results for Pythium and the white bar is the, the untreated control. Um, Piclor completely, the fumigant completely eliminated the Pythium. Mustard had no effect. The ASD with rice bran reduced it considerably as did steam and the ASD with rice bran and mustard and the steam with mustard. Another fungus that was present is called cylindrocarpin and if you have both of those things together, pythium and cylindrocarpin, um, they become much more of a problem. They, they're sort of synergistic in generating disease. Interestingly, the piclor didn't control, the fumigant didn't control cylindrocarpum at all. Uh, the ASD did a much better job and the, in this case, the ASD with the rice bran and mustard meal did the best. So the point here is that you not, we don't see a uniform response even to fumigants um, for different pathogenic species. So it's not a simple one treatment's going to be best for everything. We also found Rhizoctonia and here it was very noticeable that the ASD uh, with or without the mustard added to the rice bran was more effective than either the fumigant or steam at controlling Rhizoctonia. So overall the ASD did a reasonable job at controlling all of uh, these three pathogens. And so looking at the net returns, again like we did for the Santa Maria trial, uh, again the main difference is in uh, the cost of the ASD around $2,100 versus $1,200 for the Piclor. And in this case the yield was slightly numerically less, not statistically significantly less, uh, but that reflects in a um, $2,000 price difference in terms of, sorry, $2,000 difference in returns above harvest and treatment cost. So from talking with growers there was a lot of interest in whether we could come up with a, li a liquid carbon source rather than having to incorporate rice bran. And so there was a lot of interest in using molasses which is readily available and has been used successfully with ASD in Florida. Uh, and this shows a grower that was applying uh, the molasses, injecting it um, through the drip tape. So this you know, takes out the step of having to incorporate a solid material. So in 2012-13 we had a number of trials that looked at both rice bran and either rice bran um, at four and a half tons plus four and a half tons of molasses or in another tr couple of trials I'll show you where they did molasses on their own, on its own. Um, this was a demonstration on farm um, and this particular farmer tried it in both his conventional fields and his organic fields. And looking at the conventional field first, 
the red bar is the yield with methyl bromide and the green bar is the yield with ASD um, with uh, rice bran at nine tons per acre, um, either without a pre-plant fertilizer or with pre-plant fertilizer. And you can see in both cases, the yields are virtually the same as with methyl bromide. The treatments where he mixed rice bran and molasses were some slightly lower in terms of yields. On his organic site, however, there was no difference uh, between any of the ASD treatments in terms of yields. Uh, but these were very, a uh, yield of 40,000 pounds per acre is a very good organic yield. Um, and only about 10%, uh, no, sorry, 20% below his conventional yields. The other thing to note is that you know, there really wasn't much difference as to whether you applied pre-plant fertilizer or not, so there may be a way of saving money by um, reducing or eliminating pre-plant fertilizer. However, before we got too excited about that, um, here's another site. And the blue bars are the yields where pre-plant fertilizer was applied, and the yellow bars are when pre-plant fertilizer was not applied. So in a different site, there was a really big effect of whether or not pre-plant fertilizer was used, even with the ASD treatment with nine tons per acre of rice bran. Now this is a, I know it's a complicated graph, um, but if we just look at the blue bars for now, um, which are the ones that received pre-plant fertilizer, if we go from left to right, it goes from untreated control to molasses on its own at six tons per acre, molasses at nine tons per acre, a mixture of rice bran and molasses, rice bran at six tons, and rice bran at nine tons. And then there are two fumigants, either the picklor or methyl bromide. And you can see that uh, the best yield was with um, the rice bran uh, not statistically different at whether it was mixed with molasses at six tons or nine tons, um, not statistically different from the picklor, but it was statistically higher than the methyl bromide. So again, um, very good performance of the rice bran as the carbon source for ASD. And this is from another trial same treatments of six and nine tons molasses, mix of rice bran and molasses, and then six and nine tons of rice bran. And here, again, we see the tendency is that the molasses treatments on their own did not do as well as when the rice bran was used. So, and this was repeated at another trial that I won't show you the data for, but it was clear that um, molasses on its own is not as effective in, under California conditions um, as the, the rice bran based ASD. So we don't recommend using just molasses as a carbon source for ASD uh, in this system. And part of the reason may be that it's difficult to sustain anaerobic conditions when molasses is used. Here you can see the trace of the EH uh, for one of these trials. And you can see once the molasses was injected, it went very, very anaerobic very quickly. But it started becoming aerobic again really quickly. So then we applied the second injection of molasses and it went down again, but then it came up again. So um, you certainly have to do multiple applications of molasses to keep the EH low, um, but it's still not clear that under California conditions we get the same disease suppression that we do with the rice bran. But ASD doesn't always work. And I want to show you some of the failures. Um, here's a very spectacular one um, from Watsonville this past year. And um, the top three pictures show the progression of disease in plots that just received rice bran, but the ASD wasn't done, so there's no water added. 
and the bottom three show the rice bran with the ASD treatment. And while it slowed down the progression of the disease a little, um, by the time we reached August, um, very few plants were still alive. And this was due to an outbreak of Fusaria moxisporum. And so clearly, doing ASD in the fall in California doesn't control Fusarium. But we know that it does in some other systems. And um, particularly in Florida and Japan, where soil temperatures are higher. And so what this means is that if we, want, if we have a field that has Fusarium, then maybe we need to do the ASD earlier in the summer when the soil temperatures are higher. And that's what we're trying this year. And this shows um, if we take the threshold of being around 30 degrees centigrade or 86 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for killing Fusarium, and that's based on Japanese work, here we applied ASD in August, and you can see for most of the period, um, the soil was above um, that critical temperature. We also accumulated a lot of millivolt hours, way above the 50,000 threshold for verticillium. Now, we don't know what the threshold is for fusarium, however, but you can see that either rice bran at four and a half tons per acre or rice bran at nine tons per acre, both. Um, we got extremely strong anaerobic conditions. So we'll find out um, this season if uh, this was able to control the fusarium, because this was done in the same site where we had that um, really extensive fusarium outbreak last year. Other problems doesn't necessarily work very well in heavy soils. It can be difficult to get rid of clods. And if you have clods, then you don't get good uniform anaerobic conditions. And so you have to be very careful um, working the heavy soils. Um, if the pathogen population is too high, even if you decrease it by 90%, you may still have enough inoculum left to get disease. And we've seen that in a couple of sites, in which case you may need to do ASD more than once or combine it with another strategy. And as we've just pointed out, it may not work when, when we do it in the fall under relatively cool conditions for um, other pathogens such as Fusarium and possibly Macrophamina as well, both of which thrive in higher temperatures. Um, and we may need higher uh, temperatures for the ASD to con effectively control them. Other practical challenges. We need to find some additional carbon sources that work as well as rice bran to try and reduce the cost. And um, in addition to the cost, rice bran at nine tons per acre adds more than 300 pounds of nitrogen um, to the system, which uh, may lead to excessive nitrogen losses either through leaching or as nitrous oxide emissions. And we're measuring both of these things um, but clearly reducing the rate of rice bran um, application and finding something with a lower nitrogen content um, could be important. And the other limitation, of course, to ASD, uh, we're in the drought this year in California, and the reality is you need to add around an additional one and a half acre inches of water than you would typically apply pre-plant for strawberries. So depending on water availability, it may or may not be feasible. Just a quick um, mention of some of the work we're doing on um, mechanisms of action, and then I'll uh, finish up. And the main ways that ASD is thought to work is through the production of organic acids as a byproduct of anaerobic respiration or the production of volatile compounds, and both of these can be toxic to different pathogens, and also shifts in microbial communities in response to the anaerobic conditions that may create a more competitive or antagonistic environment that um, suppresses pathogens. Almost likely some combination of all of the above. 
And of course, the million dollar question is how are each of these processes affected by the type of carbon source used and the soil temperature when the process is done? And that's what we're trying to get at. And here's um, data showing um, the pH, which is a measure of organic acid production. The pH goes down as the organic acids are produced. And these three different lines show ASD being done at three different temperatures. And we see the greatest reduction in pH, that is the most organic acid produced in the higher temperature regime and the least in the lowest temperature. So that might be part of the temperature effect is the effect on organic acid production. Um, Mark Mazzola has been measuring, collecting the volatiles produced with different carbon sources for ASD. And um, this shows the effect of those volatiles on the growth of these three different pathogens. And the numbers in red are where you see a significant reduction in fungal growth. And we find that with the rice bran, the brassica seed meal, and the grass residue, and ethanol except for with pythium. Um, but we don't see uh, suppression by the volatiles when composted steer manure was used. So we're just starting to get a sense of how the different carbon sources might behave. Um, and this is reflected in the infection of roots with nematodes. This is with apple, where all the ASD treatments with everything except for um, the composted manure um, greatly reduced uh, the nematode infection. And last but not least, um, a couple of pretty pictures that um, are basically showing you how the genetics of the fungal communities change um, with ASD treatment. And basically, the closer the symbols are to each other, the more alike the communities are. So we have a cluster down here of all the fumigant plots. And this is from one of our field trials. We have a cluster up here of the untreated controls and interestingly, the molasses treatments, which remember didn't um, do so well. And then we have a cluster over here of all of the ASD plots that had rice bran. So ASD with rice bran is creating a unique um, fungal community that's different from what's created with fumigants or what was present initially in the untreated system or is created with ASD with molasses. And if we look at the same sort of plot but here across two different sites, what's really interesting is that even when two sites start off with rather different fungal communities, when we do the ASD with rice bran, they end up with the same uh, fungal community. So we're seeing a very characteristic response to ASD with rice bran in, in the different locations. So we're trying to work out how that relates to specific disease suppression. So these are the things we still need to understand. What carbon sources are the best for specific pathogens? What are the soil temperature thresholds for specific pathogens? And then finally, can ASD be effectively combined with other strategies um, to give broad spectrum control of the pathogens of interest? So we're trying um, ASD in combination with some other strategies like low levels of, of fumigants uh, with um, in sequence with mustard seed meal application and with different crop rotations. And we're continuing to address some of the practical field application issues and uh, very excited to look at how effective ASD is in uh, when farmers are doing it on a large scale across a lot of different sites. So with that, um, I'll stop and just have uh, be happy to answer any questions and I'd be interested to hear 
uh, if anybody has done a unmuted experience has been with whether it worked for disease suppression or if they had any challenges uh, making it work. Um, so with that, I'll hand it back to Alice. Thank you, Carol. Um, and then Joji, you can unmute your microphone as well in case you want to chime in during the Q and A. Um, I just um, wanted to um, remind everybody who wasn't here at the very beginning that if you have a question um, or you'd like to comment on Carol's question about what your experience has been with ASD so far, um, feel free to type your question or answer into the question box and um, hit return. Um, and I just want to also um, remind you that if you missed the beginning of this, um, we are recording this presentation. So you'll be able to find this in the eOrganic webinar archive. And I'll pull up the link to that in just a moment. And um, I also want to mention again that we really value your feedback. So we would very much appreciate it if you could fill out our follow-up survey, which you'll be receiving in an email later today. So with that, let's move on to the um, questions. Um, we had a lot of questions coming in. Um, I guess um, one question was um, that we got from a couple people was, um, what effect does ASD have on beneficial um, bacteria in the soil? Um, well, we're trying to, Mark Mazzola is working to try and um, identify how the populations change. Clearly, we can see that they change. Um, now, the fact that we see suppression and um, data from Mark and also from the Netherlands suggests that the soils remain suppressive um, for a while after the ASD treatment. In the case of um, tree seedling um, systems in the Netherlands, for as much as three years after ASD, they still saw greater suppression. Um, suggests that um, you know, there either there are increases in beneficials or that um, we also know that the overall numbers of bacteria and fungi increase after ASD, so there just may be a more competitive environment. Um, so we can't entirely answer that question yet. Uh, we hope to be able to um, in the next year or so. Um, we do see a shift towards um, some of the uh, yeast type of fungi, which is not unexpected. Um, we also see in some systems an increase in trichoderma, um, but what it does to specific, you know, the full range of beneficials, we're not able to say at this point. Okay. Um, we had a few questions of what additional carbon sources might be used, um, specifically, um, for example, um, leaves. Um, or sawdust or wood chips or straw, would any of those type of things work? Do you want to answer that, Joji? Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, well, wood chips and um, straws are not good carbon source for ASD. That's a short answer. Those are too carbonaceous and uh, it takes time to uh, decompose. The carbon source for ASD has to be readily decomposable. So uh, rice bran, uh, wheat bran, uh, molasses can be used and um, um, we are trying grape pumice uh, with grape skin and seeds uh, dr dried and uh, ground uh, in ongoing experiment. Okay, great. Um, Oh, can I just chime in? Absolutely. One other thing we're, we're hoping to look at is actually if we could grow a summer cover crop and That's use right. that as part of the carbon source. Maybe supplement it with some rice bran to get enough, enough carbon. Um, but that would be a way of both reducing nitrogen input um, and lowering costs if you can fit the cover crop into your rotation. That was actually the next question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Um, can you let's see? My question just went away here. Okay, here we go. Um, can you use soil gas concentrations um, as a proxy for anaerobicity? Um, this person is asking about CO two and N two O, for example. Um. Well, not not really. Um, in that. You know, that may be more difficult than um, just measuring the 
the ORP, uh, the EH level. Um, but also, you know, the N2O emissions, you need to have um, nitrate available to get that denitrified to N2O. And what we found is that as, as the soil goes anaerobic, the nitrate disappears very quickly. And so then, you know, there isn't going to be any N2O emission until it starts becoming aerobic again. And so it would be hard to interpret the N2O concentrations, I think. Any, any thoughts, Joji? Yeah, I think so. Um, as Carol said, many uh, uh, major form of inorganic nitrogen during ASD process is ammonia. And uh, the residual nitrate before starting ASD can be leached down by adding water. So it depends on residual nit nitrate level, but uh, it's going to be harder to monitor um, anaerobicis by monitoring gas co composition. Think. Okay. Um, can you comment on what is done with the plastic after um, ASD? Um, this person is asking. I assume the plastic is used to direct plant. Yeah, in the strawberry system, um, the plastic stays on the bed because they they usually use plastic for strawberry production, and so you just simply go through and and punch holes in the plastic, let the oxygen get back in the soil, and then you know, a couple of days later, you can transplant your strawberries into the plastic. So um, with strawberries, it's not, it's, we're using the same plastic that would have been put on the field anyway. Okay. Um, another question about whether you've ever tried to inoculate with a certain type of anaerobic organism, such as EM1. No, we haven't. Um, okay. Um, how are other beneficials in the soil affected um, by ASD, for example, worms? Um, that's a good question, and I don't have an answer. Okay. <laughs> um, my guess is they would probably move, uh, you know, go down to get out of the really anaerobic environment would be my sense. Um, but I don't know for sure. Okay. Um, I guess this is a question about the availability of rice bran. Is this method only economic if your berry farm is relatively close to a rice mill? Um, I guess it's about the availability and cost of rice bran. Do you want to do that, Joji? Uh, okay. Um, well, California produced rice bran, uh, rice, Northern California. That's why we are using uh, rice bran. And then I just talked to a um, rice bran supplier, and according to him, about 200,000 tons of rice bran is available uh, annually in California, which can cover uh, about 50% of California strawberry fields um, at nine tons per acre rate. Um, if you reduce six tons per acre, rice bran can cover, assuming you know all the rice bran is available for ASD, which might not be true, but uh, assuming that, um, it can cover over 80% of California strawberry fields. But, you know, depending what state you're in, it might be, yes. you know, the best thing would be to try and find out what materials are available um, okay. more locally, I think. Yes, um, and then, yeah, California rice bran is cheaper than wheat bran, but other states, wheat bran might be much cheaper than rice bran. Okay. And wheat bran, wheat bran works as good as rice bran. Great. Okay. Um, here are a couple of questions about molasses. Um, the first one is whether molasses affects the depth of anaerobic presentation in the soil profile. Um, so we'll start with that one. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons we wanted to look at molasses was to see if we could get the anaerobic conditions further down in the soil profile. Um, and, you know, we thought that maybe a combination of rice bran and molasses may, you know, give multiple benefits. Um, and certainly in, you could manage the molasses um, applications in a way to, to get um, the molasses down deeper in the profile. 
Um, the challenge for us is that, as you could see, we haven't had such good results with just molasses on its own. So um, whether that's related to temperature, um, we haven't done molasses in the summer when the temperatures are higher. Um, but you know, molasses have worked well in Florida, where the soil temperatures are much higher. So I think there's a lot we don't really understand about why molasses hasn't worked so well here in coastal California, and whether we could um, make you know make it work better by doing it in the summer. Um, those are some of the questions we're trying to get at, doing some um, greenhouse experiments at different temperatures to see if we can we can see how the molasses behaves at different temperatures. Because potentially there's a lot of benefits to being able to have a carbon, liquid carbon source that you can um, apply through the drip system and potentially move deeper in the profile. Okay, um, second question about molasses. How is molasses impacting um, nitrogen immobilization and denitrification? Um, well, the short answer is we don't know how it's affecting denitrification. We've only been able to measure that directly uh, in one or two um, locations and treatments. We haven't done it with a molasses treatment, I don't think. Is that right, Joji? Yeah, that's correct. Um, in terms of nitrogen immobilization, uh, that's, that's a really interesting question. And um, Joji, with our nitrate data, did we see any evidence of immobilization with molasses? Mm, I don't think so. Um, yeah. We'd have to go back and look at right. our data to um, answer that question. Okay, um, here's a question from someone in South Florida who's wondering about um, ASD being used along with solarization. And so if you did that, um, which would be used first? And then how soon can you plant your crop after ASD? And do you have to re retail the soil after ASD? Well, the, when you do the ASD, because of the high soil temperatures in Florida, solarization will happen at the same time. So it's kind of a you know a double whammy for the pathogens and weeds, um, and the work of Erin Roscoff at ARS shows um, you know a, you can get greater disease suppression and weed suppression from the combination of ASD and solarization versus if you just solarize the soil but didn't add the carbon source in the water to create the ASD conditions. Um, now. I don't know for, for sure for the Florida situation, but um, those soils are so sandy that I would imagine they will become aerobic very quickly um, once you remove the tarp or punch holes in the tarp, and that you should be able to plant um, pretty quickly after that. And at least in our system, and I think in the with the vegetable systems that Aaron and David Butler worked on, um, they didn't retill the beds. Okay. Um, would clear plastic be um, more effective in terms of heat and weed control? If the temperatures get hot enough uh -huh. um, to get solarization. In California, when we use the clear plastic, the weeds go crazy because it warms up the soil, but not hot enough to kill the weed seeds. So mm -hmm. here we recommend a dark plastic because that um, you know, s prevents weed growth. But in terms of you know warming up the soil to get better ASD, a clear plastic would be better. And so you know conventional farmers may do that and then use an herbicide to control the weeds. But for an organic farmer, using a dark um, tarp makes much more sense to prevent the weed control, uh, the weed growth. Okay, um, we have a couple of questions from people in more northern regions about um, how. ASD might work, and somebody's also asking um, whether there might be some way to use it under a thick um, bed of snow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, I don't. Can they tell us what the soil temperatures are under a thick bed of snow? <laughs> <laughs> if you want to write that in. <laughs> um, 
so that would be the the key I mean they make it work in the Netherlands um, where it's much cooler um, but the topping period then is at least four to six weeks or longer so um, and it would de I think you know it would depend on um, how long you could do the ASD for um, and what particular pathogens were needing to be controlled um, but it's interesting that the Dutch have been able to control fusarium even mm -hmm. though their soil temperatures are low with ASD so um, you know I'm not sure what soil temperatures we're talking about but um, I would recommend that um, the person look up some of the the Dutch work with mm -hmm. ASD to see um, how their conditions compare to what you might get uh, further north in the US my guess is under snow it's probably going to be too cold yeah okay um, here's a question um, uh, it says if I remember um, correctly there were result these there were results from pot experiments how were these pot experiments designed and would ASD be applicable to protected systems like greenhouses and high tunnels so it looks like there's a couple different questions there Joji, do you want to take that? Uh, yes, uh, in greenhouse, actually, in fact, is the main use of SD in Japan. So th that's more favorable in terms of creating warmer temperature. So I think it's um, uh, any greenhouse system can use SD for disease control. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, what is the total carbon content of rice bran um, to help with identifying local sources of carbon? Jo Joji? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think 2% um, nitrogen and then CN ratio is like, uh, uh, yeah. 30 to 40, so 60 to 80 percent in that range, huh? I think so, yeah, for dry matter basis. Okay, so what was that, um, 60 to 80 Yeah, percent? between something like that, yeah. Okay, yeah, we had sort of a related question, um, whether you measure carbon equivalence, and is it only um, carbon that's required to achieve um, ASD, for example, what is the total carbon of molasses versus bran? So people are wondering if that's a useful way of measuring this, of what, what carbon sources might be affected. Uh, um, I think not just uh, um, carbon content, but the type of carbon is also important. For example, uh, glucose, with, um, gl glucose itself can be used as a carbon source for ASD, but uh, um, more tighter, uh, stronger. Con uh, I'm sorry, your headset is going out a little there, Joji. If you could speak a little okay. louder, that would help. Okay. Okay, sorry. That's great. Um, if we use the uh, um, <clears throat> shorter, readily decomposable carbon, um, that can be used for ASD. But uh, uh, type of carbon is also important. For example, uh, like lignin or uh, cellulose can be difficult to, to be decomposed by microbes. So I think it's not just carbon, amount of carbon, but the type of carbon is also important, carbon compound. But typically, you know, we found that you need at least um, around five tons per acre of dry matter. At um, a field scale, yes. At a field scale. Yeah. And I think the Dutch who use, um, you know, hay or gra grass residues um, use at least that amount. Okay. Um, let's see. Here's somebody who's wondering that if carbon sources like rice bran seem effective for ASD treatment, um, when the market demand increases for that carbon source, wouldn't that affect the cost to match the demand? So um, there's some concern about the price. Yes. Rising. And that's why I, th I think to try and identify multiple carbon sources is important. Um, and particularly, you know, the other thing with rice bran is that as corn became more expensive, um, people started buying rice bran to use as animal feed, and that put the price up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there may be competing uses. Um, 
so that's why we're still looking. You know, it would be great if great pumice works because there's a lot of that available as a waste product from the wine industry. Um, you know, we've also looked at onion skins from onion processing. Um, you know, we're we're looking around for, um, you know, as many to have a diversity of sources because otherwise, yes, you're right. Then the, you know, as the demand goes up, the price will go up. Right. Okay. Um, here's a question about a weed, um, horsetail or equisetum that um, the growers interested in controlling. Um, do you know of? There, it, know whether ASD is effective in controlling that weed? No, that isn't a weed that we really have in this area, so we haven't tested that. Um, do you know where, what um, part of the country? The if you'd like to type that in, um, whoever, and whoever um, asked that question, um, we'll come back to that. Um, okay, meanwhile, um, while we're waiting for that, um, when using ethanol as the carbon source for ASD, what amounts and what concentrations are needed? That's the uh, Japanese uh, method. They are trying to uh, encourage that, and we haven't tested it yet, but uh, they use diluted ethanol, like 1%. Um, and the amount... Hmm. I've got I, yeah I've got a uh, there was a figure early on um, I can look it up very quickly uh, one to two percent um, and they use a hundred to two hundred um, liters of that one to two percent solution per square meter okay. so um, that's the units that they've given the application rate in. Um, and it varies a little bit depending on um, what crop and what pest. But if you want to go back and, you know, this will be on uh, you know, and, and online, um, the sixth slide had a table from Japan showing the different application rates for the different crops. Okay. Um, here's a question about, um, okay, this person has deer that would punch an occasional hole in the plastic. Is there a tolerable number of holes that would be allowable in ASD treatment? <laughs> Good question. Yeah, you'd probably, if there are big holes, you'd probably want to try and patch them because um, that, that will, you know, make the system aerobic for, you know, um, some volume of soil around where the hole is. Okay. Um, we usually recommend, you know, because sometimes we do get tears or whatever, we recommend that um, growers repair the plastic to the extent possible. Okay. Um, and um, this is a question about what you think the biggest gaps are that need to be addressed in ASD research. I think understanding how to control specific pathogens, mm -hmm. because clearly, um, you know, it's not uniform. You know, the, the threshold that works for verticillium doesn't work for fusarium. Um, seems to work pretty well for rhizoctonia, but it probably doesn't work um, from what little information we have for macrofamina. So, how much of that relates to the particular carbon source and how much of it relates to t soil temperature, I think is what we really need to work out. Um, so, so that, you know, if we know what pathogens are in a field, you know, then we could better say, okay, you should try and do ASD at this time of the year for this length of time. Um, I think it's getting to that level of specificity that's, you know, really key. The other thing is the challenge of um, doing it in very heavy soils um, if you can't get, uh, you know, really break up the soil well. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on that, Joji. Yes. Um, for clay soil, um, it tends to form a clod that has a lot of macropores in the bed especially for bed uh, treatment. Uh, 
the, the way we've been, we've been doing in California, uh, it's very challenging. So might be better to do a flat treatment in heavier soil. Yeah, that might be necessary. Okay, um, we have time for one or two more questions here. Um, what is the chance that ASD might work for sclerotium diseases compared to the pathogens tested in this study? I believe um, that was tested in Florida, and I think it I think it worked if I remember correctly. Um, and some of the other sclerotium diseases are known to be controlled by flooding, in which case I would expect ASD to work um, for them. Okay. Like if, white mold and white rot, um, potatoes and onions. I know, you know, there's old work saying that they could be controlled by summer flooding. So I would expect ASD, as long as the temperature's right, um, would be able to effectively control them. Okay, and um, last question that we have time for here. Um, how does ASD affect salinity levels? Very good question. Um, ASD with rice bran or rice bran and mustard seed meal um, can lead to quite uh, to a significant increase in salinity um, when um, the you know following ASD when you're getting the mineralization. Um, going on. You can get quite an accumulation of nitrate that can raise the salinity. And that was an issue for us in um, the very dry winters here in California. Um, we had to be careful to go and um, put some irrigation water on in the winter to lower the salinity a little for the strawberries, which are very, very sensitive to salinity. So that is something to be aware of, particularly with high nitrogen containing um, carbon sources. Okay, thank you. Um, we are running out of time, but I'd like to thank everyone for your questions and mention once again that you can find this and many other upcoming and archived webinars, including our last webinar on ASD from 2011 um, by Carol. Um, and um, you can find those in our webinar archive at the link on your screen. And we'd also very much appreciate it if you could fill out our follow-up survey that you'll be receiving in an email later today. So thank you so much for giving this presentation, Carol and Joji. And thank you to everyone for joining us online today. Great. Thank, thank you, Alice. Thank you, Alice.